want to take this time and welcome you to another episode of Just Teach. If this is your first time visiting the channel, I want to extend a very heartfelt welcome to you. It was Ezra that wrote in Ezra chapter 7, verse 10, that Ezra prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Listen, that is our goal here at Just Teach Ministries to seek, do, and teach the word and the will of God. If you haven't already, we're asking you to click that thumbs up button. That will certainly help us out. That sends a message to YouTube and lets them know that you are enjoying this type of content. And if you haven't, certainly subscribe to the channel and share the channel with somebody. All of these things go such a long way in helping us spread the message of the gospel all around the world. Now, as always, I do want to let you know that there are notes available along with today's lesson. If you go in the description of this video, you can click the more button, a drop down menu will appear and under the title lesson notes is a blue hyperlink. It'll take you to a Google docs. You can download the notes to this lesson. They are absolutely free. I just pray that they are an encouragement and a help to you as you study the word of God. And as an additional bonus, uh, I have been preparing uh, slide decks through Prezi over the past couple of lessons. So I am going to add a link to the Prezi presentation. Uh, if that is some type of encouragement or support to you as you prepare uh, the lesson, listen, we're just helpers one to another. Uh, so that link is going to be down there if it'll help you out as well. So we are continuing in the spring quarter of the International Sunday School lesson. We follow the publisher of Standard Lesson Commentary, uh, the theme for this quarter is examining our faith. Uh, on last quarter, we were talking about faith that pleases God. We are continuing in the conversation of faith and talking about examining our faith. We're taking the time to be introspective, to look at our walk with God, to look at our works and ensure that what we are doing and the way that we are living our lives is it gives glory to the kingdom. It gives honor to God. Today's lesson tremendously powerful, tremendously uh, imperative to the life of the believer. We're talking about defending our faith. It, it takes a certain nuance. It takes a certain amount of finesse to defend the faith without being defensive. And we're going to talk about it today. We're going to talk about how do you approach defending the faith because the faith does need defending. Certainly in today's day and time in the culture that we live in, Christianity as a faith is certainly uh, come under uh, all types of attacks, you know, whether it's from a, a legal standpoint, from a legislative standpoint, from a government standpoint, and then certainly in some of our just day to day lives, our interactions between coworkers and friends and family, certainly uh, Christians may feel at times that they need to be on guard and defend themselves. But there's a way to do it because at all times, how many of y'all know that we want to effectively represent Christ in a loving way? way. So we're coming out of 1 Peter chapter number three, and we're going to take verses uh, 8 through 17 as a text. So here we are. Let's do a little background. Let's do as we always do, establish the lesson context as we dive into, uh, into today's text. So I have for background that Peter is believed to have written this letter in Rome to the early Christian church now experiencing state level persecution. It's it's always interesting when we think about the persecution of the early church, we think about people like philosophies and secular thought. We think about people like Judaizers and, and, and people from a Jewish background who try to force Jewish customs on new converts. And we think about all different types of opposition from like uh from some of the uh from some of the jewish leaders like the pharisees and people that stood in opposition to jesus's ministry but it's it's interesting to see how at this point in history now christianity is coming under the scrutiny of not just those who are in the faith but those who are outside of the faith and particularly those who are in high positions of power so at the time that this is being written it is believed that the emperor nero uh who was the emperor of rome is uh is in uh is in a position of power at this point now uh at this time in history all throughout europe in parts of asia minor in certain certain parts of northern africa all of these 
uh, territories were under the Roman occupation. So they fell under Emperor Nero. And Peter uh, gave maybe a wink, if you will, to uh, to Rome in 1 Peter 5 and 13, where it says that the church that is at Babylon elect together with you, salute you, and so doth Marcus, my son. So we understand at this point that the empire of Babylon uh, didn't exist, that that was an Old Testament construct. We know that the, the empire of Babylon was uh, was conquered by the Persians. And then subsequently after the Persians, you had the Greeks, and after the Greeks, you had the Romans. So there is no Babylon at this time. And what is believed is that Babylon was code for Rome. You know, if, if people wanted to write something that they felt was potentially negative about Rome, they didn't want to just call Rome out at fear of losing their life, of course. So what was going on at this time is that Nero blamed the Christians for the great fire in Rome, and he began to punish them cruelly. Now, what many people have said and many historians have said is that Nero himself actually started the fire, and he just used it as an ex as an excuse to, to, to uh, persecute the early church. But whatever it is, from a political standpoint, he used that great fire to get uh, to get some uh, government backing to 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 get the politics in his favor because he wanted to express his discontent towards Christianity. I mean, at the end of the day, it's believed that he wanted to express his discontent to a, a lot of things. Uh, Christianity just kind of helped happen to fall within the uh, within his gaze as well. So, the letter that that Peter is writing, this letter is to encourage believers in how to respond spiritually when suffering unjustly suffering for their faith, suffering from a state level persecution. This lesson is very timely. It's particularly if you are, are anywhere, honestly, anywhere in the, in the world, you know, um, I dare not say that Western culture is the only uh, a, a government system where that is that is passing laws that are against Christianity. There are some countries around the world that it's illegal to read the Bible. It is, it is illegal for Christians to gather together in public worship. There, there are certain places where Christians are losing their lives if they declare their faith in God. It, it is it is very, very challenging. It is, it is very challenging to see, you know, some of the opposition that, that Christianity faces uh, in, in places around the world. But it's it is very providential to consider that God in his infinite wisdom spoke through the apostles, spoke through the, the writers of scripture and gave us direction in how do we respond? What is the proper character when we are under persecution from a government standpoint? So in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, Peter wrote, he says, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through what? manifold temptations that the trial of your faith being much more precious than that of gold that perisheth, it says, though it be tried by fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And then he went on to write in 1 Peter 4 and 12, he says, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. He, he's not necessarily writing about uh, spiritual trials and temptations. He's not talking about people that are coming against you from others' face. He's not necessarily talking about you just being tempted to, to uh, engage in sin and iniquity. No, he's talking about the external trials that come from people in government authority that would want to resist the Christian faith. He's saying to stand firm during those times. Don't think it's strange that these things have come to try your faith that your faith might be found what? To praise, honor, and glory our Heavenly Father. So then finally, I wanted to give just a quick example. Uh, uh, there are many biblical examples of people in scripture who endured suffering. Of course, Christ, you know, uh, Christ is, is our a model example of enduring suffering, but the reality is, is that the suffering that Jesus experienced was at a cataclysmic level. It is way beyond anything that we can experience because he endured suffering to the point that he died on the cross. But then there are other characters 
in scripture that did display some level of suffering. And I think another notable character is that of Apostle Paul. And I have written here that uh, scripture illustrates many examples of believers suffering physical, verbal, emotional attack, yet in turn, they would show love and goodwill toward their persecutors for the higher purpose of the kingdom. There were several places in scripture that Paul had written about some of the things that he had suffered, you know, as a minister of the gospel. Uh, but I think one of the best stories is in Acts chapter number 14. And it talks about that when he was in a particular region ministering, that the people that he was ministering to turned around and began to attack him. And then he, and in Acts 14 and 19, it says, and there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people in having what stoned Paul drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. So they stoned him and then dragged him out of the city. It says, how be it as the disciples stood round about him, it says he rose up. He was, he was doing ministry with a group of people. He was the one that got stoned and they're standing there looking at him and they're trying to figure out what's going to happen with Paul. It says that he rose up and it says, and he came into the city and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. It's crazy to think that Paul endured such persecution that he was stoned. And after being stoned and dragged out the city, he got back up and walked right back into the city to continue to do ministry. That is such an exciting, you know, such a shining example of enduring suffering for the purpose of the cross. So let's do this. Let's pick up where our, our, our text picks up in 1 Peter chapter number three. We're uh, beginning at verse number eight. Uh, Peter is writing uh, some, some characteristics of, of how we are to endure suffering. He says, finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. It says, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, he says, but contrary wise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing. There's, there's a lot of words in there <laughs> that we could define. So for the sake of time, I just had to curate a few that I think could kind of drive this conversation and give us a clear understanding of what Peter is writing about here. So he begins to list out different attributes and characteristics of what you need to display and exude during persecution. One mind, compassion, love as brethren, pitiful, courteous. Let's take the time to define just some of these things. When we talk about one mind, it literally means to be like-minded. It means to be concordant. Now that's more than just a word. That's more than just a concept that you can articulate. Because the reality is, is that a society, society would love nothing more in certain places for us to come together, but it seems like we always struggle to do that. Honestly, if people would look at the body of Christ today, some might make certain observations and say, even as the body of Christ, we struggle to come together as one mind. So many different organizations, so many different denominations, so many different churches. How is it that we can come together as one mind? Well, Paul gave us an idea. He gave us a suggestion in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse 10. It says, now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, what? He says that ye shall speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you. So how is it that Paul is suggesting that we come together as one mind? He's saying, put the same words in your mouth. Paul was addressing the fact that people are already taking sides from different, you know, church leaders and saying, I'm from Peter and I'm from Paul and I'm from Apollos. And different people were saying who they were, they were claiming who their, their church leader was, who their church preacher was. And Paul was saying, look, so there be no divisions. He's saying, let us all say the same thing. Now, it's interesting to observe that. Because some people might think that your conversation follows your mind and not your mind follows your conversation. But let's think about it like this. It's a phenomenal example in the book of Genesis when God sought to 
uh, caused confusion between the people that were building the Tower of Babel, what did he do? He confused their language to where they were not able to speak toward one another with clarity. They were not able to say the same thing. And since they weren't able to say the same thing, they were not able to work together. So what you say, so important. If you want people to have the same mind, you need to make sure that everybody is saying the same thing. What else did Peter write? He said, have compassion. If you look at the, the Greek word there for compassion, you can see where we get the word sympathy. That is exactly what that is. It means suffering or feeling like with another. It means to be sympathetic. I want you to look at this. <laughs> Hopefully I can put this up here with, with some clarity. Let me, let me switch this screen real quick because what's kind of interesting uh, I wanted to put out there, you know, when, when I was in grad school, you can see this, this book says emotional intelligence, emotional intelligence. It, uh, I was in grad school and I was taking a strategic management class. And uh, one of the books that we had to read was this e emotional intelligence. And I was, I was reading the book and honestly, I thought it was a joke. I was like, did somebody really take the time to write this book? Because this, this seems to be just a, a long drawn out explanation to say, treat people right. Don't be mean to people, treat them with some courtesy and some respect. And you would think that that wouldn't be necessary to call that out. But if you've worked in corporate America for any amount of time, I bet you've had a manager, you've had a director, you've had uh, some type of vice president that just for whatever reason, doesn't seem to know how to treat people. And it's like, how did you get in the position that you are in? They lack emotional intelligence. They lack what Paul would say right here. They lack compassion. They, they don't know how to sympathize with people. They don't know how to empathize with people. And Paul is saying, look, as Christians, even if you have a person over you, a manager, a director, vice president, a governor, a president of the United States, and somebody who you feel is not treating you right, you still have a responsibility to act in compassion towards that person. What else did, did Peter write? He wrote, uh, love as brethren. That's why I have that, uh, that image right there. Let me pull it back up here. That's why I have that image right there that says uh, Philadelphos. This, interesting enough, I know we're used to the idea of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, but this Philadelphos is, is actually plural. And this is actually the only time that this uh, conjugation of the word appears in scripture. But when we talk about brotherly love, it's not just necessarily just brotherly, it, it means familial. So it could be brother, it could be sister, it could, it could be dad, it could be mom, it could be spouse, it could be towards your children. He's saying the same level of regard that you have towards your family, he's saying, have that towards your brothers and sisters in Christ, have that towards people that are without. Treat them with the level of love. It was the, the writer of Proverbs in Proverbs 17 and 17. It says a friend loves at all times. And it says and a brother is born for adversity. It, it's something remarkable about the love of a brother because a brother will have your back even when you're wrong. That, that's how powerful the love of a brother is. He, your, friends, your friends will love you. But they'll be like, oh, this is getting a little too hairy. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes the situation might get too bad and like, I need, I need to step away. A brother, a brother will go, he'll go to war with you. He'll go to bat with you. And that's, that's really what Peter is getting at right here. He's saying, treat these people with a very high level of passion. Love them like a brother. Then he also said pitiful. This word pitiful it means to have strong bowels. You wouldn't think that. You're like, what? What does that have to do with pitiful? And in a biblical and ecclesiastical language, it means compassionate or tenderhearted. And that's where you might have probably more likely seen this word translated in scripture. You've seen it translated to tenderhearted, particularly in Ephesians 4 and 32. But the question you might ask yourself is like, why, why would you use the word pitiful? And why does that mean having strong bowels? Well, in, a, in an ancient, you know, philosophical thought is that um, a person's midsection, their core, their stomach, it is the center of their being. 
Um, and that's why you get phrases like when, when you're trying to make a decision and somebody says, trust your gut. That, that's what they're saying from, from the core of your being. They're saying, this is where your conscious lies. This is where your understanding is. You know, when they say, follow your gut, you know, that's, that's literally what they're saying. So when he's saying, you know, be pitiful, he's saying from the core of your being, he's saying, treat people tenderhearted, treat people with compassion. In other words, it's not phony. It's not fake. You know, you're, you're not doing it uh, just idle platitudes or because somebody else said so, but from your being, you are treating people right. He says, be courteous. Being courteous, it means to be friendly. It means to be kind. It means to show deference towards. It's, it's a certain level of respect. It's, it's, it, Peter is outlining so many, he's highlighting so many important uh, concepts around treating people right who are treating you wrong. And at the end of the day, what he says in verse nine is that he says, do not do evil for evil. But at the end of the day, what he's saying, he's saying, let God defend you. He says in verse nine, not rendering evil for evil, railing for railing. It says, but contrary wise blessing. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 29. It says, say not, I will do so to him as he hath done unto me. Don't treat people wrong because they've treated you wrong. He says, I will render to the man according to his work. He said, don't, don't say these things. There are so many scriptures that, that talk about not doing evil for evil. I, 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 I have a list of them in the notes. I encourage you go in the description of this video, click the more button on the lesson notes, download it. I've got this, this concept of not doing evil for evil. It is, it is talked about from the old Testament all the way through the new Testament. We are without excuse as believers to wonder, is, is it right to just, you know, to pop off and just give people a piece of our mind? No, we don't do evil for evil. If somebody hits you, do you hit them back? No, we don't do evil for evil. If somebody offends your, your, your spouse, oh my gosh, as a husband, listen, there's, there's no more sensitive area in my life than my spouse. If somebody did something, of you, you are most likely <laughs> to get the worst out of me doing something to my spouse. You, you could probably offend me and I take it a lot better than you do something to offend her. And the reality is, is that scripture, no matter the circumstances, does not give us the freedom, the latitude, or the encouragement to render evil for evil but what does it do instead? In Romans 12 and 19, it says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. Now, I appreciate this text because it says give place to wrath. In other words, wrath is coming. R wrath is on the menu. You, 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 sometimes when people do you wrong, you're like, are they going to get away with that? No, they're not going to get away with that. It says, it says give place unto wrath. But how is that wrath going to be given place? It says, for it is written, God said, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. So understand this. By you not rendering evil for evil, you are applying faith. You're trusting God to handle it. And I know, ooh, you listen, I know that that's tough. I know it's tough because we have to wrestle with the timing of God. And we like, okay, God. I'm giving place to your wrath when you're going to do it because I'm ready for you to do it now. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm ready for this person to get paid back right now. And the scripture says in several places that the just have to live by faith and you have to give space and allow God to do it. So it says don't rail for rail. That means reviling. But it says contrary wise, it, contrary wise, it means to do the opposite. It, it, it means to do uh, exactly different from what people would expect. Everybody would expect you to go off. It says bless them. The Greek word for blessing right there is eulogia. It's, it's where we actually get the English word eulogy. What happens, a, a blessing or a eulogia, it means to speak well of someone. Wow. You mean to tell me instead of going off on them, and even instead of being quiet, speak well of them. See, God is trying to put some mechanisms in place to not only guard, but to heal your heart. 
See, it's really hard to be mean and nasty towards someone that you're speaking well of. And that's what God is ultimately after. He's after your healing. He's after your wholeness. And he's saying for your sake and for the sake of peace on earth, he's saying, speak well of them. Verse number 10, it says, for he that will love life and see good days, he said, let him refrain his tongue from evil. You want to enjoy life? You want to be able to go through life and not have a bad conscience, have to look over your shoulder, wonder if somebody's coming to retaliate to you? You want to have good days? Control your tongue. It says, in his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. It says, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Kind of an interesting passage of scripture there. We're going to talk about a few things. Let me go back to this real quick. We're going to talk about a few things as regard to it. So first of all, Peter says, control your tongue. You know, it was James that wrote how the tongue is a fiery member. And if it that the same man that can control his tongue, he said, that man is a perfect man. If you can control your tongue, you can control your whole body. He said, we put bits in the horses of mouse and we direct these huge animals. It's with their mouth. We, we've, we've got uh, uh, these, these uh, steering mechanisms that we use to turn a whole ship. And he's saying, just as that one steering mechanism can control a whole cruise line or ship, a huge yacht, he's saying your tongue controls you. So he's saying if you can control your tongue, you can control yourself. And in this, in this very same breath, Peter is saying, let him refrain his tongue. What does the psalmist say? He says, keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Guile is deceit. Guile is craftiness. Can we say that? Because some of us, we, we tell the truth, but we, we add some seasoning in that truth. We, we add some deception in that truth. Because what you're trying to do is you don't want to just tell the truth and let people come to their own conclusions. No, you're trying to guide them to a place where you want them to land as it regards to the truth. I want you to think this way about the truth and you put guile in there. But what did it say about Jesus? It said Jesus knew no sin, neither was any guile found in his mouth. So understand this. James wrote about how your tongue starts fires. So if you can refrain from starting these fires, you can enjoy life, you can love life, and have good days. So then Peter, he goes on to write, and he starts to employ some different uh, literary tools. Uh, there's several literary tools that he uses throughout this text, and two of them, one is called Hebrew parallelism, and the other one is called anthropomorphism. Hebrew parallelism and anthropomorphism. Now, the Hebrew parallelism is, is things that you, you've you seen this so many times in scripture, you probably had just never heard this specific uh, uh, term applied to it. But what it, what you see in verse number 10 is you're seeing the, the, the tongue and the lips being correlated and then the evil and the guile being for correlated. So he says, let him refrain his tongue from evil, his lips that they speak no guile. And then he says, uh, in, in verse number 11, he says, seek peace and ensue it. That, that word ensue means the same thing. Proverbs chapter 10, uh, verse one, it says, the Proverbs of Solomon, it says, a wise man maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is heaviness on the mother. So the wise and the foolish are given parallel to each other. And then the glad and the heaviness are given parallel to each other. So sometimes it's parallelism. It is comparing to like things, or sometimes it's comparing to opposite things. So uh, in, in this particular context, in, in 1 Peter 3, he, he's comparing to like things. So Hebrew poetry, it exhibits parallelism uh, at its chief characteristics, we see parallelism when two or more lines of a Hebrew poem 
correspond closely with one another in order to make a point. So that's what Peter is doing right here. He's trying to draw the point of controlling your tongue and not uh, using your tongue or your lips to speak evil or guile. And he's saying, seek peace and ensue it. Then finally, you have what's called anthropomorphism. You've probably heard this before a million times. It is an attribute of, of human characteristics or be, it's, it is applying the attributes of human characteristics or behavior to God, to an animal, or to an object. So in verse number 12, when it talks about the eyes of the Lord, or when it talks about his ears are open to the prayers, these are people that control their tongues. But then he says, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. It's, it's helping you see God in human terms. Because since, of course, God is a spirit, that's what scripture talks about in John chapter number four, that, that God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So, but when you assign these anthropomorphic terms, it helps you see God in a clearer way. And it helps you understand how important it is to, to operate in a way that pleases God because God is watching you. He says he gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. So he said he will turn his face against them that do evil. So you don't want to put yourself in a place where you are denied the blessings of God. Verse number 13, it says, who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are you and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Look at what Peter is writing here. Challenging stuff to address, it's, it's, it's one thing to encourage people to treat people right who are treating them right. Or it's one thing to treat, to, you know, to encourage people to walk in righteousness in, in seasons of peace. But the, the church at this point is under some intense opposition. And it's to the point where people are losing their lives at the threat of their faith. And, and that was the hallmark of early Christians people that were willing to die for their faith. So Peter is employing another literary tool here called rhetorical questions, and he's saying, who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? Of course, he's, he's not asking them to answer these questions, but he's asking them to consider it for a second, to, to, to ponder on it, because the reality is he's saying, look, the harm that these people can inflict on you Really, at the end of the day, it doesn't compare to the harm that God can inflict. And, and I'd rather be at peace with God than be at peace with man. So what, it, what, it, what does it say in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28? I'm probably getting ahead of myself, but it says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both what? The soul and the body in hell. So in other words, it, it's telling us that, look, if you're going to be afraid of anything, at the end of the day, be afraid of God. And he's saying, hopefully that can give you some type of solace, some type of grounding in your suffering. Because understand this, we're not making light of what we go through. And we're not sitting here acting like we're not suffering. This, this suffering, it literally means to undergo evils. It means to be afflicted. And, and these things are, are, are saddening. People losing their life for the faith, that's sad. People being abused for the faith, that's sad. Honestly, from an American standpoint, just not being able to go to church, not being able to gather in public worship, that's hurtful to hear. But he's saying, if you suffer for righteousness sakes, he says, you will be happy. That happiness, it means blessed. That word is actually translated to bless more in the scripture, uh, more places in scripture than it is to happy. And it actually, when you read the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter five, it is this same word. It, so this word that's translated to happy, it, it means to be blessed. That, that means you, you are in a place of favor with God. You are blessed. So here it is. Peter is saying, look, if you're going to be afraid of anything, listen, be afraid of not pleasing God because I'd rather give God glory. There was an occasion in the book of Isaiah 
when God used the prophet Isaiah to talk to the people of Judah. And he was telling them, listen, we're about to send an enemy that's going to attack you. But don't be afraid of the enemy. You need to be more concerned about God. So he says in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 13, he says, sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear. Don't be afraid of the enemy. All the enemy can do is take your stuff. But he says, and let him be your dread. In other words, let God be your dread. And it says, and he shall be for what? A sanctuary. God promised that he will be with us always, even until the end of the world. So the blessedness and one of the happiness that we have is to know that what we go through, we don't go through alone, but we've got a God with us. So now that, that Peter has talked about the character that we ought to have uh, while we're enduring persecution and showing the brotherly love and being compassionate and all that stuff and being pitiful and different things like that. And he's talking about not rendering evil for evil, but controlling your tongue and to, to uh, have a perspective to where you are blessed, even though you go through suffering. Now he's turning and saying, now you just don't have a responsibility to yourself, but get this. You have a responsibility to the faith. There, there, are, there is a mission that you have to accomplish even in the midst of suffering. So he says in verse number 15, he says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of hope that is in you with meekness and fear. I, you know, I read this verse and I think about all the different opinions and perspectives that are out there as it relates to Christianity and the Christian faith. And, and, I, and I've said this many times before. I feel like there's a lot of people out there that try to give answers, that try to give the Christian response and Christian rhetoric, but it sounds like people who really haven't sanctified God in their heart. Listen, Jesus made it very clear in John chapter number eight. He says, if you continue in my word, you will be my disciples indeed. And he says, and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. The only way that you can know truth, the only way that you can have the revelation of God is that if you continue in his word. So when we talk about sanctifying the Lord in your hearts, that is an adherence to the word and the will of God. It means to render or acknowledge to be vulnerable, it means to hallow. That hallow means to make holy. It means to declare holy. But it's not just lip service. It is the stamp of sacredness that passes over from the holiness of God, get this, to whatever has any connection to God. If you are connected to the instruction of God, if you are connected to the word and the will of God, you are sanctified by virtue of the fact that you are connected to that which is holy. And when you have been made holy in your heart, now revelation has been made available to you and you can speak according to truth. So he says, be ready. That word ready, it means of a person is ready. It means to be prepared. It means to be ready to do something. There are two angles to this readiness. Number one, you got to be ready to do good. In Titus chapter 3, verse 1, it says, put them in mind to be subject, get this, to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. This is saying part of you giving, being ready to give an answer is that, you're, that you have not disqualified yourself by the way that you have carried yourself. You have not disqualified yourself because you're not living according to the standard of God. But before you can preach the word of God, before you can teach the word of God, you have to first live the word of God. There's a very popular, very popular saying out there that says, preach the gospel at all times and use words if necessary. Now, we know using words is necessary. We're going to talk about that in a second. But the reality is, is that your lifestyle preach. So you can't be always rebellious. You can't be always uh, uh, 
being disobedient and and breaking laws and 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 being uh, uh, cantankerous and causing evil in society, and then turn around and want to represent righteousness. You can't do that. So he says, be subject to principalities and powers and obey magistrates. It that that is literally talking about the laws of the land, talking about the legal, the governors, the presidents, the the, the natural leaders. Then it also not just be ready in in character to do good but also be ready for Christ's return. Matthew 24 and 41, it says, therefore be ye also ready for in such an hour as you think the son of man cometh. You, you can't be mid stride in mistreating people because what's going to happen if God comes back and you over here sinning, <laughs> you over here not living according to the word of God. So he says, if you're ready, he says, have an answer. If you're ready, then you have an answer. You've sanctified God. You're ready. This, this word answer is apologia. It's where we get the English word apologetics. It's where we get the, the study and the concept of apologetics. It's literally a verbal defense. It is a speech in defense. Apologetics is more than just defending Christianity, but we are most familiar with it from that standpoint. But there's such thing as Muslim apologists. There's such thing as Jewish apologists. There's such thing as atheist apologists. There's such thing as all different types of defenders of all different types of, of lines of beliefs and thinking. But what we are concerned about, of course, is those who are going to defend the gospel. And that is what we are all called to do as believers. But what I want to touch on really quickly, what I touch on really quickly is because this is a very, this is a very robust concept. And what I want to talk about more than what it is, is how do we go about doing it? Because I think the reality is, is that when you look at a lot of Christians that choose to engage in uh, theological discussions, we see a lot of zeal without knowledge. We see a lot of people that are passionate about the faith, that are passionate about scripture, that are passionate about God, but they do not know how to go about defending the faith. So in 2 Timothy 2 and 24, Paul wrote, it says, and the servant of the Lord must not what? Strive. It must be, be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient. This is how you go about representing the faith. Be ready to teach, have an answer, but don't sit up and argue with people all day. Romans 10 and 17, it says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When it says be ready to give an answer, that is a verbal answer. As, as much as I said, preach the gospel, but uh, and, and if necessary, use words, it is necessary to use words. P uh, living, a, living your life is, is necessary, but the scripture, if scripture says faith cometh by hearing, the only way people are going to have faith is if you take the time to preach and teach the word of God to them. They can't just observe it in your life. They've got to hear it, but you got to say it in the right way. First John 3 and 10, it says... In this, the children of God are manifest in the children of the devil. Whosoever do not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. So if you're not living righteous and you're not loving the brethren, as Peter had already written earlier, he's saying you're not the children of God. You're, you're not in a position. You're not ready to provide a defense. So I got this last scripture and, and I'm, and I'm going to move on because Sometimes when we talk about defending the faith, we think that God needs our defense. We're like, man, God needs my help. God, God is under attack and he needs my help. God doesn't need our help. We need God's help. Now, what we are trying to do is we're trying to represent the faith here on earth because that is our responsibility. But Paul wrote very clearly, Romans chapter three, verse three, he says, for what if some don't believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Let God be true, but every man a liar. In other words, listen, it doesn't matter if nobody chooses to believe in God, which is impossible because I believe in God. But let's say for whatever reason, nobody believes in God. Listen, God is still God. Faith in God is still real. God is still the God of all creation, the creators of heaven and earth. Listen, God does not need our validation. But what it is, it is our task, our goal, and our responsibility to represent God here on earth. 
So finally, in verses 16 and 17, this is us giving an answer continued. It says, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. It says, for it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil doing. In other words, Peter is saying, look, when you represent the faith properly and you don't render evil for evil and you're not using your tongue to say things that you're going to regret, you can stand in a clear conscience and know that you have represented Christ well. So this conscience means it means to be free from guilt. It is a conscience of restitude. It is a of right rectitude. Excuse me. It means of right conduct. Scripture says that we work, that the Lord is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him. How? In spirit and in truth. There has to be a truth to your walk with God. So he says that you will have a, a good conscience. Uh, as, and, and it goes on to say not only having a good conscience, but it says it says your good conversations in Christ. So here it is. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm skipping to the wrong part of this verse where I, I wanted to talk about the fact that it says that you don't have to be ashamed. That, there it is. It says they may be ashamed. Why? For falsely accusing you. This word shame means it means that they are put to shame and they suffer repulse. They are shamed because, you know, when people can't tell the truth about you, they'll make up a lie and they'll be ashamed. It says, because your good conversation in Christ, your conversation is not just your words. It means your lifestyle. It, it means your behavior. It means your walk. So it's not just you. You honor God with your words, but you honor God in the way that you carry yourself for it's better if the will of God be so that you suffer the will uh, that you suffer for well doing than for evil doing. Listen, the reality is, is that I know it's cliche to say, but trouble really does not last always. And, and if God had said so many times in scripture that if we suffer with him, we will reign with him. Suffering is, is for a season. It's for a time. But when that season is passed, scripture says that we will reap a reward if we faint not. So Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, he said, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. We might be suffering, but the truth of the matter is what we're suffering cannot be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed to us. The devil would have us thinking that what we're going through, it is so terrible that we are not going to be able to have any blessedness in our lives. But that's not what scripture tells us. Scripture tells us that if we suffer for Christ, he says, happy are you. Listen, that is our lesson for today. We are talking about defending our faith, not just the faith, not just your faith. It is our faith. So I trust and pray. I hope something was said that can encourage you along the way. I want to remind you, as always, my contact information is in the description of this video. Listen, I, I said it on the other video for Union Gospel Press. We are working on getting a P.O. box. Some of you have mentioned that uh, you wanted to be able to communicate via P.O. box. So I'm going to get that in place. So please look on, be on the lookout for that soon. Uh, and then also this last announcement, I want to repeat and let everybody know as always, listen, we go live every Sunday morning, 8.30 Central Standard Time. So we're asking you, listen, come on out on Sunday mornings, fellowship with us. We're going over this exact same curriculum, the International Sunday School lesson. It, it is so much more fun to, to interact with, with a live audience. Uh, and, and it's just an opportunity for us to bless, share in faith. If you have any questions, it's a great time for us to discuss and maybe get those questions answered. So I'm inviting you, come on out, invite somebody, bring them along with you. And let's have a time in the Lord. Listen, and if all says the same, we'll see you. And until then, we love you with the love of the Lord. Perhaps you'd like to be a financial support to Just Teach Ministries. There are two ways that you can give through Cash App at dollar sign C O D W C or through Super Thanks, which is located in the ribbon of buttons just below this video. And remember, any amount you give is greatly appreciated.